everybody, and welcome to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have Dan Shapir. Hey, hey, all the way from Tel Aviv. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. We have a special guest this week, and that is Josh Ponalat. It's Josh Ponalat. Hi, from South Africa. These countries are these countries are cool. That's really cool. I've talked to a few people from South Africa over the years doing the show. Dan's in Israel, and I'm in the United States, so we're totally multinational here. So most people know two places in South Africa. It's either Johannesburg or Cape Town. I'm in neither. It's a very small town along the coast. Kind of sleepy, kind of touristy. It's called Plettenberg Bay. You should check it out. It's really beautiful. Great. So after this, you'll go to the beach, maybe go fishing. I think a good Mai Tai and a, and a beer or something like that, you know, <laughs> because why not, right? Yeah. By paradise, the way, where in South Africa? You live in paradise. All right. I'm done talking about it. It's not going to get above freezing here today. So... Um, <laughs> Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood, and I just launched my book, Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. It's up on Amazon. We self-published it. I would love your support. If you want to go check it out, you can find it there, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. Have a good one. Max out. We brought you on to talk about Swagger and OpenAPI. Do you want to just kind of give us the quick elevator pitch as far as what Swagger is, OpenAPI is, and kind of how they tie together, and then we can dive in a little deeper on the discussion? Yeah, sure. And, and that's, that's actually a big question because Swagger and Open API are, are used so interchangeably that a lot of people struggle with it. And it's, it's silly. It's silly because it was sort of the disambiguation didn't launch easily. So it started as Swagger. Everything was Swagger. And Swagger is a specification or a, a, a set of protocols around describing RESTful APIs. That's the buzzword, right? RESTful APIs. And then when Swagger got bigger and larger, it got taken over by a company called SmartBear. And when SmartBear took over, they wanted to keep the heart of it as open source and as as open as possible. So they donated the specification, the thing that describes it, into the Open Linux Foundation, and that's called OpenAPI. So going forward, OpenAPI is the spec, and Swagger is just the tooling that SmartBear kept. Hopefully that's sort of gets us going there. And then we, we can like mm-hmm. touch on it again, figure that disambiguation out. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I kind of went and dug through like the Swagger website and the Open API website. And I'm, I'm still not sure if I'm completely clear on what they do. Do you want to just talk a little bit about how Swagger and Open API work to, to solve some of these issues? Yeah. So if, I mean, this is a, this is front end, right? So we know what package.json is, right? It's this JSON file where we throw in our dependencies and we've got like a field called name. In order to make package.json work, we need to know what fields can go in there. OpenAPI is the specification for these files and it basically says which fields can go in there. And the purpose of this file is to describe an API. So if you have, say, Twitter's API and you want to know how to send a tweet, you got to know its method, say post. You got to know its URL, say, I don't know, slash tweets. I I really, I shouldn't, probably shouldn't have picked Twitter's API. It's not my uh, go-to. But in order to capture those details, you need to have a way of capturing those details. I mean, sure, you could just write it down in a napkin, but Open API is a standard way of describing those details. It's typically a YAML file. So if I were to give you an Open API definition, I'd be giving you a YAML file. And from that, because it's done to spec, you know, you get all the benefits. You can create documentation or you can get tooling to understand an API, what's in it and what the, the data going in and coming out looks like. So basically you're saying that it's essentially a standard schema for RESTful APIs? That's it, yeah. So that's Open API. That's the big buzzword because Open API is the one that's the, the heart of it. It's the schema. Dan said RESTful APIs, and I'm wondering, does it encompass any other sorts of API schemas or approaches. You know, GraphQL kind of does it differently enough to where I don't know if the specification makes sense for that. So no, um, you know, OpenAPI does not describe other types of APIs and where I'd say type would be something like gRPC, GraphQL, or any other RPC frameworks. The focus is on HTTP. So now we say RESTful, but RESTful is also a a design constraint. It's bigger than HTTP specifically. So OpenAPI would probably be best described as an HTTP schema, describing the the HTTP details like method, URL, parameters, and, and the body. 
That makes sense. I'm I'm also wondering with open APIs. So yes, you provide make a post request to this URL. Does it also include the authentication schema? So yeah, it, it does include those details. In authentication, they, they typically get carried over either as a header, you know, so you could describe it just as the header itself, but open API does have a special case, so special ways of describing authentication and authorization. And you can give them a single name and they can go as detailed as being, say, OAuth2, HTTP basic, especially in the later latest specification. I gotcha. So yeah, you can say it's a JWT or it's from OAuth or it's, you know, an right. API key in a header or a token from one of these in a header or anything right. like that. You can put that in there. So you could describe it, you know, just using headers or just using query parameters, right? Which typically the two that I'd be in. But there is a special case because it is so standardized and you want to have the nuances of it. Just write it in one place. Say, this is OAuth2. I'm, I'm not going to say this is just an authorization header, right? Because you want to know those details and right. that's important to communicate. Yeah, it's an authorization header, but you got the token for it from OAuth2. Gotcha. Exactly. All right. So uh, the other thing is, is on the parameters, are they typed or are there recommendations for the specific format? Because I may say like start date, end date, but here in the US, we do month, day, year, and in other parts of the world is day, month, year. So I may want right. to specify even the format, right? So Open API does its best, and I'll describe how it does that in a little bit of you know, high-level view, but it's going to have its limitations of how far it can describe the details of the, of the, the request response, because it does describe both, right? They're both important. In your case, you know, it would be something like this is a, a string, or a, and it has a format of date time. Right? It wouldn't go so as far. So date time would be against one of the ISO standards. You know, you wouldn't, it wouldn't easily be able to describe, say, an American format date string, but you could use something like a regex or something like that to sort of put limits on the, the string that you're sending. So to clarify this point, suppose I'm describing, I, I'm building an API and I, I want to use the open API. Does it generally mean that I just apply existing schemas to my API, or does it mean that I need to extend the schema to cover my API? What would be the typical way that I would go about it? Okay, so let me try and break that, break that out there. Open API gives you the spec of how to describe APIs. You would start with either a tool or your IDE, because now you want to write or generate a YAML file that describes your API. And you would start with the basics like, you know, um, uh, URL and, and method. When it comes to describing the pieces of it, say the query parameter or more specifically the body parameter, the body parameter specifically uses something called JSON schema or a derivative. It's sort of a, they kind of fudged it a bit there when it's, it's not full JSON schema. They, they're changing this now, but it is very, very close to JSON schema. That would be the shape or type of data that you're sending back and forth. Beyond that, it would be, you could say that this is a JSON or this is an XML body type or anything that fits that sort of standard by adding the MIME type. I mean, we can look into a quick run through of how you would get something working from OpenAPI. I find a lot of people find that useful. Should we give it a bash? Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay. Typically, people come to OpenAPI after they've got an API. They want to describe an old API. They want to get this API under management. And they'll do this. They, they want to first, you know, they want to get it down on paper, if you will. And so they've got this API. They, they'll use tools like Curl or Postman or a bunch of others to interact with this API. And then they're going to record that into a document that describes those interactions. Now, the tooling is getting more and more advanced where this can become somewhat automated. As, in, as you interact with your API, you can take that and it'll generate an open API definition or a YAML file. Once you've got that, you can sort of clean it up and, and prepare it so that it will match the API that sits on a server somewhere. Once you've got this YAML file, which describes the details of some, possibly all, requests and responses that come out of your server, you can then generate documentation to say, okay, and well, now I can generate this documentation. Now I can see my API. I can also see what's, what's in it at a glance, and then I can go beyond that. So once I've got my API described in some formal specification, which is what OpenAPI is, 
I can now, you know, use tooling to really leverage that and take it to the next level of, you know, putting this in my CI CD pipeline to check if my API changes or to generate SDK clients. And once I've got that phase, which is typically the, the way people are introduced to open API and Swagger, I can start designing APIs before I build them. All right. So that's sort of the frontier. Let me describe it. Let me tell you what an API could look like. And then let's go and build it from that spec. Right. So if I would like want to contrast open API with, let's say, uh, a GraphQL, GraphQL mm-hmm. is usually used in kind of like a, a greenfield type project. I'm going to be building a new API. I want it uh, codified. Maybe I'll use GraphQL. What you're describing is I already have an API in place and I want to codify it. I want to document it. I want to kind of uh, get it under control so that going forward, mm-hmm. I won't make a mess of things and, and introduce all sorts of contradictions. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is I, ha- I can use this process and this method of describing, let's, ca- let's call them HTTP-based APIs or even RESTful mm-hmm. APIs, and then I'll record what I have I'll codify it, I'll document it, and uh, I'll kind of, uh, set it down in stone, as it were, right. in a bunch of YAML files. And from that point on, I can ensure that I don't introduce contradictions, that uh, I have proper testing, that if I want to develop a new, new clients for this API, I'll be consistent with it. If I want to rewrite my server, I know that I'll be consistent with the APIs that I already have. And going forward, if I want to enhance the API, I can do it in a quote-unquote sort of a standard way. Is that, am I more or less echoing what you said? Yeah, I think, so let's, let's put GraphQL to the side there for a second. We can revisit it for sure. But what you've described is, you know, the, the first stage or the first interaction is, you know, let's get this API formalized, codified, if you will. But where it really gets exciting is when you start designing ahead of coding. And, and this format gives you this, this, this possibility of saying, getting feedback on an API, which as we found today, APIs can live a long time. And, and their commitments, especially with your public APIs that sit out there and say, you know, this is our API. It cannot easily be changed. So we want to get it somewhat right ahead of time. And we've also got this medium of connecting front-end and back-end developers. So you can code your back-end independently of your front-end. Now, you want to keep those feedback loops pretty tight either way, but you can code against a contract of an API, right? So you know the API, so now you can just code against that. And you can put mocking on either side of it. GraphQL is... It's definitely used in, in greed fielding projects, but it is an entirely different schema. It is a protocol as well as tooling and, and things like that. Open API describes HTTP, right? It doesn't introduce anything new to HTTP. Whereas GraphQL, it's you go through one endpoint and you describe your data as a, a series of nodes on a graph, which is pretty cool. And then they've got a, a custom schema or um, it is schema, right? That's, it's a string that you send into a GraphQL server, and it will take that string, break it down into some AST, gather the data, and send it back to you, which is great for bandwidth-constrained clients, right? Because you're asking for a small set of data in a compact way, and, and you're getting just that data. HTTP has a bad rep for, well, you know, we're, we've got the restful semantics of A, B, and C, And so if I want to get all the data I need for my client, I have to make several requests, sometimes picking back off older requests. So I get one request, and based on that, I'll make another request. And there's definitely ways of getting the benefits of GraphQL into HTTP, several interesting projects around that. But coming back to what OpenAPI is, it doesn't add anything new to HTTP. It is just a way of codifying it and allowing tooling to leverage that document, that YAML file, to to be able to do all sorts of things. So it's kind of like schema for schemas. Yeah, that's that's definitely very meta, and I like it. And and that's pretty accurate too, because Open API describes how you can describe your API, but then you need to describe your API, right? So that that's a schema for your API, a schema What's, of schemas. The thing that I'm I'm seeing here is that. 
if you put the schema up and let's say you, you know, you put the specification together in a YAML file, people can grab it, they can look at it. I'm assuming, you know, you put it in a YAML file so that a program can actually pick it up, right? And you can 100%. use it to, to specify a driver for the API is where I see people using this. So yeah, what does that use case look like? I'm glad you brought that up because one of the when Swagger was was smaller, it was it was an API schema for humans and computers. Right. So YAML was chosen because it's somewhat easier to write than JSON, which is very strict. Right. If you have a trailing comma on JSON and it blows up and you start wondering why that's the case, whereas YAML is far more forgiving. But of course, you want computers to be able to understand and break it down. So yeah, it is it is a format to to share. Once you get the YAML file, sure you could read it, but you know, it's it's much more convenient to get a tool to generate something pretty for you. Right. So you get a nice little website or web page generated from the YAML on the fly, and that you'll you'll end up consuming. Or you'll use the tooling to generate those SDKs or server stubs. Again, all of the circles around this one document that simply, you know, tells you how the API works. Maybe not the connecting points, the semantics of, oh, well, call this operation and then this one. And then when you have all those done, you'll have done a bank transaction. It's more on the, you know, the concrete inputs and outputs, right? Which gives you, which goes a long way. So I assume that uh, these days, a common use case for these YAML files would be to generate a DTS file or something like that. I'm going to be ignorant here. What's a DTS file? It's, uh, I was going to uh, ask too. <laughs> <laughs> DTS file is a definitions file for TypeScript. So it basically gotcha. like, d- specifies an API that you can use from TypeScript, and then you will get all the autocomplete and stuff like, and good stuff like that in your development environment. And that's a fantastic use case. And yes, that is one of the um, ways that Open API helps. Right. So you generate a client in TypeScript. Not only does it generate the TypeScript definitions, but you've also got the SDK itself, right? The code that'll execute. So in your IDE, you can explore an API by simply hitting tab, right? Which is fantastic. I mean, that for me is like nirvana almost because now I can sit there and say, oh, I want to execute this tab. These are the list of operations. What data do I need? Tab, tab. You know, these are the fields and I can hit go. Are there use cases other than the tooling then that we're seeing with this? Yeah, so one of the, I mean, it all comes down to tools because you want computers to process it. Yeah. But in addition to documentation, which is probably the leading use case, you want to show developers how to use your API. And you get that almost for free because once you got your YAML file, bam, you've got a website. And there's there's several great projects out there that'll do this for you. Then we've got our SDKs, our service stubs. But the other use case, if you will, is, is the oversight of knowing that your API is consistent in style is now becoming more and more popular. The fact that all your operation IDs have camel case, which a lot of larger corporations are big on because that consistency gives them a strength to move developers around, that gives them the quality that they're looking for, that their API doesn't look completely different. There's the oversight that comes from knowing breaking changes. Adding a query parameter is fine. Taking one away or changing the shape of a JSON object might not be so great. And so if you've got the previous definition and you update to a new one, you can now tell in your CICD pipeline if this is now a breaking change. So all of these oversights come from knowing your API. And Open API is that thing. You know it once you've got it written down. And I'm hoping that there's going to be a whole bunch of more things that we haven't thought of to add to this because... Yeah, knowing the thing is is having it described, I guess. Given that we've spoken all this time about Open API, what are we going to say, you know, bring up the topic of Swagger? Because we talked about how Swagger is distinct from Open API. So, like, what is it and what does it mean? Now's a great time to bring it up. So, again, looking back at the history, everything was Swagger up till a point. And then they took the specification part out and they donated that and that became Open API. What was left was all the tooling, the initial tooling that helped make Swagger useful. It wasn't good enough that, you know, you can describe an API. You want to get that documentation and those client SDKs. So there's a whole bunch of tools with the word Swagger in them. And that's what Swagger is today. So when we refer to Swagger, we're referring to those tools, you know, of which Swagger UI is probably one of the most popular because it, it was the oldest and got bundled with all the um, servers. So you would have a server, and then one of your endpoints would serve this 
API documentation for free because of the way it was configured. And you've got Swagger Cogen, which is the thing that takes, you know, a definition file, a YAML file, and it generates all your, you can either generate static documentation or the SDKs, the clients, the, the mock tests, all of that stuff, because it's a templating system. And there is validators on your definition file. So you want to make sure your definition file is valid, little things like that. There's several bunches. Those are Swagger today. An open API simply refers to the specification, how to write YAML files. So Swagger is the tooling and the open, and open API is a specification. That's a distinction. Correct. More specifically, Swagger is a, a finite set of tooling. A lot of tools now are you know, becoming open API tooling in order, in order to adopt the more open name, if you will. So Swagger is a very specific set of tooling, most of which is still curated by, by the company that took on Swagger, and that's SmartBear. When you say curated, you mean these are open source tools? Correct. The vast majority are all open source, and they, they either live in GitHub, and they're, they've got communities around them. I understand. I keep looking at this, and I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, people can use this to kind of automate the process of, of using the, the APIs. And now we're talking about some of the tools. Are there tools out there that test APIs or do pen testing on the APIs or things like yeah. that based on the open API? We are seeing tools spring up like that all, um, I want to say all the time, but it, you know, they, the more niche ones come and go. A lot of companies have in-house tooling that do their own form of pen testing, if you will. Testing APIs is, is quite tricky. You can certainly do input-output tests sort of as, a, you know, if I give these inputs, I expect these outputs. And, and validation is, is a, a form of testing where you can put this during your runtime so that requests coming in We'll go through this validation layer to make sure that you know it matches the type that Open API has already described. But actual testing of saying, yeah, my API is up and all the operations in it work as expected, that's a little harder because there's a lot of semantics involved with that. But there's definitely more and more interesting use cases coming out of Open API that we're seeing right now. The the big one is around um, oversight making sure your APIs look and feel the way you want them to, especially when you have hundreds, sometimes thousands. Can you give a more detailed example of what you mean by oversight? So oversight, where for me, are those, those two things of you know, breaking changes, right? So diffing between APIs and making sure your description of your API is consistent, whether that's um, you've got a, every object has a 400, or every response has a 200 request. So in order to ensure this, you have these systems in place that look at the YAML files and do linting on them. So that's oversight for your CIDC pipeline. So you can now see how consistent your APIs are. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. Yeah, that's one thing that I like, right, is that, you know, as we get into programming languages, we get used to sort of the overall schema of the way things are put together. And so, yeah, it kind of has a consistent feel. And if something doesn't match the flow of the language, it kind of sticks out whenever we have to use it. And so, yeah, I like that as kind of an audit of your API to go, okay, I'm looking at the entire spectrum that we have here and that one doesn't fit, right? And so then I can go in and I can say, yeah, we need to fix that. So, you know, the parameter names don't line up or the parameter names indicate one type over another, or, you know, the naming just, you know, we've got RESTful all over here, and then we've got this weird outlier for whatever reason. How can we make it line up? Exactly. It could be as simple as, I don't want to see a URL that includes the word execute on it, right? Because that indicates some sort of RPC thing that sort of breaks our 
restful ideology. And consistency gives you a lot of freedom, right? If you know that without researching this one out of 100 APIs, that it's going to behave and look and feel the way you expect, that gives you a leg up in consuming that API. Yeah. Can you do like a little bit maybe of a name dropping? I mean, can you give examples of uh, like APIs or services that our listeners might be familiar with that uh, you can name that currently already use OpenAPI? Sure. So the OpenAPI team itself is, is like all the big boys are in it from Google through Amazon. Microsoft has got two guys on it. Google's definitely in it. Amazon uses it for all of their open API or API gateway stuff. They've got, so here's another use case. That's a, that's a great way. Amazon, if you've ever worked with their API gateway, you know, you've got to describe the sort of um, runtime thing that your requests come in. And then either you link, you tend to link those to Lambda functions. So Lambda functions are these little tiny little programs that you can put in the cloud, if you will. And so Amazon has the system. In order to make some of those connections, you can use vendor extensions on your OpenAPI YAML. The YAML file you describe describes the HTTP part. Great. But what if you wanted to add some custom stuff in there to say, well, this operation, this one should be linked to that Lambda function, or this operation has you know, th- these constraints on it, you know, and I should flag every time this operation is called, I want this red flag to pop up in my system. Now, you can go in there and you can add this to the YAML file where your API is described. So these consuming services can now know more information about operations and, and your API in general. Amazon's gateway is, is a great example of this, or AWS's gateway. Microsoft is a big proponent of OData. It's a, another format or a, a more constraints on, on the way your data is formed. Open API is, it really was the collection of these disparate entities who wanted to formalize it. There are different HTTP-based schemas out there, and they wanted to get the standard, right? That tends to be what OpenAPI is, the standard agreement on that. Now, you wrote a whole book on this. You know, we're, we're sitting here and we're going, okay, you know, kind of get bits and pieces of this, but uh, what's kind of the flow of the book? You know, how, how does it explain this and how does it guide people through being able to use these techniques and tools? Cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book. It's not complete yet, but the book I'm writing, um, Designing APIs with Swagger and Open API, is, is a primer to get you, to give you value out of using Open API, right? So we start with, you know, describing APIs today. So a lot of the HTTP APIs, they exist today and they're a little bit of the wild west of knowing what's in there. So the very first thing is, let's get it on paper. Let's, let's put it down so we can use it. And then building on from there, we, we look at how we can design APIs without having written code first, right? What's the process around designing your RESTful, hopefully RESTful APIs or HTTP-based APIs before you write the code? And what sort of feedback loop can you get out of it from you know, getting your server stubs up, getting a front-end engineer to start coding against that, and getting that feedback that can tie back into your YAML file that you use as the, the center of this little universe. And then lastly, um, in terms of the flow of the book, so you know, part one, let's describe the API. Part two, let's design APIs. Part three takes a look at, well, how can I get some real juice out of the system? You know, something similar to what AWS's API gateway has, where they've added data into the operation. How can I look at building my own tooling around open API so I can get more, more mileage out of it? you know, for my own purposes, things that haven't been built yet. I think you're publishing it with Manning, so it'd be on the Manning Early Access Program. Yeah, you should definitely go check it out. It's, uh, I think they call it MEEP, Manning Early Access. Yeah, that's the one. I know, I always, no, sure. I always feel funny saying MEEP. Go yeah, MEEP. That's true. Oh, go MEEP it, folks. <laughs> MEEP away. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it's definitely out there, and uh, part one's done, and, and, and we're going through part two with part three pieces as well. Yeah, I was looking through it before before this uh, podcast, and it looks really good. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Appreciate it. One of my, my big driving factors here is, first, to give, to give value out of it, because that's where any conversation starts, is you know, it needs to provide you with value. But secondly, is to see how it can evolve. I'm a real big proponent of 
of schemas for things. You know, once we've got a schema, once we've described something to some sort of formal spec, you know, the world is our oyster. There's, there's so much tooling that is yet to be designed around this. It's sort of another dimension on top of it. You know, once you've got, you can have an API and once you can start putting an API in a box, you know, which you've described it now and you can start moving and interacting with that box, right? It becomes another dimension of operating on APIs as data. And that excites me a lot. So if we said that open API is a schema on a schema, then your book is a schema on a schema on a schema. Right? We need to get those little <laughs> indexes up there. I like that it's, it's a lot. It's turtles yeah. all the way down, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, very cool. So what aspects of this have we not asked about or talked about? Open API and Swagger, you know, the disambiguation is still a thing. And I'm, and I'm glad we get to chat about it because Open API, you know, that's, the spec is the heart of it at the end of the day. And it's, it's important to encourage people to describe things. Maybe it's not their APIs, it's, it's something else. But putting things down on paper is an incredibly powerful thing. The tooling around Open API today is very mature. We're seeing it grow. The Open API specification itself is versioned. So we'd had a lot of people will see Swagger 2, which is now supposed to be called Open API 2. And we're currently on Open API 3, which brought in a huge amount of power to you as a, as a writer of API definitions to be able to describe more and more things. And, uh, and that specification is being worked on constantly. So the 3.1 release is going to bring in even more powerful features to it. So it's something to keep an eye on, especially as tooling catches up with those features. So yeah, version of the spec is, is important to know because a lot of tools will support two, perhaps not three. But uh, the maturity of two is, is like years and years old. Maturity of three is about, I want to say, a year and a half old. But the, the tooling is definitely fast on this. Thanks to you know, all that effort and open source of getting the stuff up and going. Makes sense. I'm, I'm also curious about some of this. It seems like we're kind of in this season where a lot of things are evolving with APIs. You know, we've got REST, and then we've got GraphQL, and then we've got gRPC, and we've got... I'm trying to remember. There were a couple of other ones that looked really, really interesting. One of them started with a V that was... Anyway. Um, well, there is one there I'll, I'll, I'll stop you on, which is quite interesting. It's Hypermedium. So mm-hmm. Hypermedia is the the purists for REST, right? So yeah, guys, you really want to do that REST. for years on Ruby Rogues. <laughs> <laughs> so that's definitely getting uh, some traction as well, getting hyper Hypermedia. And then how that ties into HTTP, how it really leverages the full power of HTTP, just to complete the list, which was... Yeah, I guess what I'm um, driving toward is, where is all of this taking us, right? We, we get better tooling, we get better ways of specifying APIs, and then you know maybe we get better APIs. Do we wind up going to a place where this actually impacts, you know, maybe there's a hyper hypermedia API or you know something like that that comes out of this where it's like look right. this this methodology makes it really easy to specify in this way and and it makes all of these tools just kind of seamless right where i don't even need the twitter driver anymore i just need an open api driver right or are there other directions where this is heading so i i think the direction is to to treat apis as first class citizens by turning them into data and the idea being once we've got them in data, we can operate on them just like any other form of data. And, and that's sort of the direction we're going with here where we've got schemas and we're describing things, different cases of them. GRPC, what it did was it brought something called protobufs, right, which are fantastical, compact binary format that you know, is great for speedy you know, um, protocols, right, where HTTP is quite large and it's still text-based. And it took that and it added a schema to it. And by that very merit alone, it's, it's, it's taken gRPC into so many more applications because now you know how to use it. Now you can know how to use it by being able to share it, by being able to critique it just by looking at the schema. Once you can treat APIs as first-class citizens, as data, you, know, you get to look at the whole world as a, as a different way. And just showing how that you know, gRPC, which took protobufs, great protocol, and just added a schema on top of it. And that's the, the power behind it, getting in front of people's, into people's systems by leveraging that, which I don't think would have been possible without having a schema 
gRPC's power comes from being able to generate your servers and clients, you know, so that you can int- you can talk this this protocol buffer, which is very hard. It's you know very compact, very binary. So you want to automate that, and that's from treating the API itself as um, as a first class citizen. So that's the direction I think all of these things are working their way towards. That's really really interesting, and it's always interesting too just to see you know for all the things that you're talking about that you see coming some of the unintended things that are going to, going to come out of this that are going to make a difference for people too. Right. That's the exciting part. The stuff that we haven't, you know, thought about yet as a result of, of these innovations around the world and APIs and, and other things too. If you think about the, you know, APIs, do we want more of them or do we want less of them? Once you weigh that question and think, well, APIs are good. You know, they, they allow me to, to build things that I couldn't build before. Right now, because of all the APIs that exist out there, I can send SMSs, I can make phone calls, I can, you know, spin up images in the cloud at a whim. And so, yes, we want more APIs. So anything that helps us get more APIs, you know, I think is a good thing. It allows us to innovate on whole new levels. So do you know when the book's going to come out? I think it's coming out next year, mid next year, I think. I'm, I'm not actually sure on the end date. I'm just writing at heavy pace because uh, it, it's interesting stuff and uh, i'm sure my publishers will will shout at me to to narrow it down and, and give more concrete things like that but i think it's planned for mid next year sounds great well, i'll see if i can find a link to it on the manning early access and hopefully people can get their hands on it because i think that would be awesome is there anything else dan that you feel like we need to talk about uh no i think it's uh, pretty well covered from my perspective all right a few years ago at a JavaScript conference, I was approached by Nader Dabit. And you might know him for the React Native Radio podcast. He's also a developer evangelist for Amazon. And when he came to me, we had a conversation about React Native. And the thing that I love about React Native is that it's approachable, it's web technology, and it's cross-platform. And it makes a lot of things really easy for developers to jump in and do interesting things on mobile with JavaScript. So we've had this show now running for several years. React Native Radio, where we interview people about the React Native ecosystem, some of the things that are coming out in React and how they affect mobile, and other options that you have for mobile development. So if you're doing mobile development, you're doing it in JavaScript, you're looking for a good option, or maybe you're just trying to stay current with React Native, then go check out React Native Radio at reactnativeradio.com. Well, then should we go ahead and do some picks? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. I usually let our hosts go first, but My wife is going to walk in here literally in like two minutes (laughs) and uh, she's going to be like, okay, it's time to go. My three-year-old has a a Halloween program for her preschool class. So, Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, we're we're definitely doing that. We're we're recording this on Halloween. So (laughs) happy Halloween, everybody. None of us are wearing any sort of a mask. There is a mask on my hoodie. It's a Ruby Rogues hoodie. And there's a mask on our logo. In fact, I should just throw this out there. So if you go to teespring.com slash stores slash devchat.tv. If you go to the show notes, you can get it. And I'll probably also have some link like uh, shirts.devchat.tv or something you can hit. But yeah, um, I'm putting up shirts for the different podcasts. People can you know go and buy shirts. I, I get asked about this periodically. Where do I get stuff? And I'm like, well... <laughs> I want stuff, Chuck. I want stuff. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to put that out there. Last time we ran campaigns for this, which was a few years ago, I bought this hoodie. And so uh, the one I'm wearing as we record this is the one that's up there for set. Well, not the exact one, I guess, but same design, same, you know, uh, manufacturer and stuff. We also have women's tees. So if that's something that you're looking for, we're going to put that up too. I've had a few people ask me about Patreon and things like that as far as being able to support the show. So I'm working on getting that up. So yeah, I'm going to throw that out. Another quick uh, pick that I have, and this is something that I've used for a while. I just don't pick a lot of the tools that I use because I don't think about it. It's kind of become an everyday thing. But one of them is BusyCal on my Mac. Really loving that. (laughs) It's a terrific program. Makes the calendar thing really, really easy. I think I've added like 20 something calendars to it because I'm insane. And because we used to have a calendar for every show. That's part of the deal. We don't anymore. Now we just manage it on like two or three Google calendars. So I'm going to pick that. Because that, that's been really great. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and drop off the call and I'll let Dan and Josh do their picks and then we will uh, have another show next week. So max out, everybody. Enjoy. Have some have fun with your daughter. Will do. Okay, Josh, do you want to pick your picks? 
So you'll have to you'll have to help me out here, Dan. What are we picking? What's what's the field of? It could be any sort of pick you like. It doesn't have to be to do anything with software. Actually, my picks have nothing to do with software. If you want, I will go first, and I'll give you a few more minutes to think about yours. So I've been running over the last couple of episodes through all sorts of what I consider to be really, really good fantasy books from authors that have kind of um, dropped off most people's radar, so they're less known, given, uh, you know, everybody's familiar with, still familiar with Tolkien and obviously with Game of Thrones and, and George Martin and all these sorts of books. So I'm running through a list of less well-known books, which I still consider to be incredibly awesome. So this time I'm going to mention a series of books called uh, Saga of the Pliocene Exile. It's by uh, Julian May. She, she's, well, she's an awesome author. She wrote these uh, way back in the 80s. It's a series of uh, four books. It's not exactly fantasy. The rapper, the rapping is actually more like science fiction. It's people like living in the future where it's a very advanced society. We've encountered aliens and uh, the humans are part of this uh, uh, galactic type federation. And some people like don't fit in because they're outcasts and just uh, can't handle this modern existence. So when there's this sort of a doorway that's open to, into six million years in the past on Earth, and it's just this one-way doorway. So once you go back, there's no return. So you go there and then you have to stay there. So And the people don't really know what's back there, except that it's like, you know, prehistoric Earth. So a lot of these sort of people decide to go back there. And what they find there is really, really surprising um, I don't want to spoil anything, but it kind of becomes a fantasy sort of a story once the people go back there. And it's it's not really magic, but it's like telepathy taking a form of magic. And, you know, I'm I'm not describing it as well as I would like, but it's a really incredibly awesome series of books. And I really, really highly recommend them. And And yeah. So that's that's going to be my pick for today, and I'm going to put in the link to uh, the Wikipedia post describing these series of books. And and now over to you, Josh, if you have your picks. Cool, Dan. Well, I don't think I can top that. That sounds amazing. And as a as a reader, I need to ask a big question: Is the series complete? Yes, know that. the series itself is complete. Like I said, it was written back in the 80s. She later wrote a, a whole bunch of additional books about different like periods, like I said, because the beginning of the story actually happens in the, in the future before they go back to the past. So she then kept on writing more books about uh, the future era, and I've not read all of them, so I don't know if that's complete. But the books that describe that what occurring like six million years ago in the Pliocene era, that's actually, like I said, those are those four books and it's wholly self-contained and, and the story is done. So it's not like, you know, what would happen in a lot of series of books today where you start reading, you get all excited and then you realize that the story has not come out yet and maybe never will, hint, hint, George R. R. Martin. And uh, no, so in this case, it's it's done, it's self-contained, and you'll totally enjoy it just reading those four books. You don't need to read any of our, other of our other books. Thanks, Dan. That's, that's important for me as a, as a reader. Reading a series and getting stuck on a book and waiting for that next one is just so disappointing. And it, you know, kudos to the authors who go into the effort of writing these stories that are so entertaining. But wow, I feel like I need to take on series completely at a time. All right, so picks. So while you were chatting, I, I had to think about things that I use quite regularly, and I'm going to list two picks. The first one is I discovered um, as part of writing this book, it's called ASCII Doc. And for those who don't know it, it's like Markdown, but kind of on steroids. And it's really cool to generate PDF files if you're comfortable writing Markdown files. So I would definitely go check that out. And my second pick is going to be a little command line tool, and it's called FASD. And I, I'm a console junkie, and I often you know, love bouncing around on my terminal. But one of the stickiest points is navigating from one folder to the next. 
So this little FASD tool I use to jump to folders, usually using just part of their name. So long as they're in my ZHS or Bash history, it'll, it'll make an educated guess and it'll get me there. So I definitely, if you, if you enjoy messing around the terminal, this is, this is a godsend. Yeah, it sounds really awesome, and I'll definitely check it out. I use the terminal a lot, and I wasn't familiar with this tool. So thank you very much for that. Okay, in that case, uh, I think I'll wrap it up. Uh, wrapping it up for the first time by myself without Chuck. So thank you all for listening to JavaScript Jabber, and over and out. Bye-bye. Happy Halloween. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.